right. Well, hello everyone. It's great to see everybody here on in person and in Zoom land uh, on this uh, chilly spring day. And chilly is good because uh, the topic of today's lecture is going to be about cold place. We're going to learn how cartography could be very dynamic. There are places on Earth that actually change. They shrink and they expand sometimes. Uh, and so we, we're going to have to. We're going to get to, to hear from that on a very unique day because what the speaker is going to talk about is how is this seen from space. It happens to be the 61st anniversary of Tina's first show space. Talk about the Yuri Gagarin going into space in April 12, 1961. So, the communist day. Is but before that, let's concentrate on more terrestrial matters, and that is the. Um, Annual meeting of the Rocky Mountain Map Society that uh, you get to elect your uh, directors of the, the board of, 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 of the society, plus other uh, financial matters. And for that, we're going to have our lifetime appointed treasurer and founder of the Rocky Mountain Map Society, Les Brown, that is going to uh, tell us how we're doing it financially and we'll be going Now it's a good thing to get a treasurer's report written on a piece of paper of this size. We're going to begin with the treasurer's report, and then we'll go to the uh, the highly contested, much anticipated election. God, the the, the media attention we've gotten was extraordinary. Uh, but first, the treasurer's report. We are modestly profitable and, and continually are modestly profitable. We have $29,908.22 in the bank. We have an audit committee that independently inspects the books. Uh, Jim Hensiger and Chris Lane, and they have done so again this year and have, have given their uh, assessment that we are solvent and the treasurer is not stealing any funds. Uh, we have 127 paid members last year. So, of course, we're right in the cycle this year, but paid through December 31st, 127 members, uh, which is about a record. Remarkably, the society keeps growing, uh, which surprises me, but it does. Uh, Shall I test it now? And did I just need to hold the mic up closer to me? Well, Okay, how does it sound now? Okay, so that's what I needed to do. Can you guys still hear me? All right. Uh, for those who couldn't hear on Zoom, we are solvent, $29,000 in the bank, and our, our independent committee has audited us, and we are in good form. That is, the, and we have 127 paid members as of last year. So now let's go on to the election. You've all received this uh, notice. I do want to mention uh, one person, Patrick McGranahan. Patrick, why don't you stand up for our audience? Uh, so Patrick is a new member of the board. He is a professional surveyor and uh, very knowledgeable about the world of mapping. And we're very happy to have you on the, on the ballot. Uh, so you have a, a lot list of uh, officers and directors. Uh, we could vote for each person independently if it was insisted on by the members here. Does anybody want that? Not hearing any, uh, anyone wanting that? We'll vote for all members. Uh, yes, sir. Now what? Well, 
Okay. Are they hearing? Uh, let us know if they're hearing buzzing. That's about as close as they're going to get. Okay. Uh, anyhow, we're going to go on with the election, whether they can hear us or not in Zoom land. Uh, I hope they can. Uh, uh, are there any nominations from the floor? Seeing none, uh, I'll call the uh, call for the vote. All in favor of the slate of candidates for the board and officers, please say yes. All opposed, say no. All right, the yeses have it. Uh, so we declare this uh, complete. Something else? We have two no's on Zoom, but you have to be present to vote. So that's not going to be an issue you need to worry about. Uh, is there any other business to come before uh, the annual meeting? OK, we'll con conclude that the annual meeting is finished. And one final plea, please pay your dues. For those who haven't paid your dues, uh, please, it's only $25, and uh, we need your money. Okay, so hopefully everybody's uh, listening in Zoom land. That's good. So next, uh, we're going to have our program director, uh, that uh, uh, Naomi Heiser, that is going to introduce the speaker and probably tell us what's coming up uh, in terms of programs. So get this close to you. <laughs> Thank you. Can everyone hear me here? And Kevin, are you getting any? Knows on Zoom. Nothing. Yay. All right. Um, we have one more program of the spring, I think. Um, May 24th, we have a speaker, another one from CU. She's a geography professor, teaches um, GIS and all sorts of subjects. And um, she's going to speak on the use of GIS and environmental planning and land use, um, wildlife management, those kind of things. Um, and maybe also have some of her student work that she could present to show you what um, students are learning now in their GIS, which is geospatial information systems. Um, she does um, have to have a surgery this month, so I'm hoping we're still going to be okay for May, and I will certainly send out information as soon as we know exactly what's going on. Um, I wanted to remind you about the Sensing Ice exhibition at CU Boulder at the library where I work in the Benson Earth Sciences Building. I brought um, some little cards here that you can pick up on your way out. If you can't see the exhibit, that's fine, but there's a QR code on the card so that you can listen to the specially composed glacial music, symphonic music that goes with the exhibit. So if you want to take the card, please do. Um, those are all the announcements I have. And after May, we'll go into our summer hiatus and um, have some really good programs lined up for the fall. All right, so I'm gonna introduce now Michael Willis. Um, he's an assistant professor of geological sciences and a fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, which is series at CU Boulder. His work blends geodetic and remote sensing tools with big data and in situ measurements to answer questions about sea level change, natural hazards, landscape change, and the cryosphere. Um, he's taught some classes at CU, such as Exploring Earth and Our Deadly Planet um, and Natural Catastrophes and Geological Hazards. And he will cover tonight the history of mapping the Greenland ice sheet and the importance of this mapping to society. So welcome, Michael. And thank you for inviting me. Now, let's see, is this picking up loud enough, do you think? Oh. So, yeah, uh, I'm an assistant professor. Um, my background is in geodesy mostly uh, for my master's, which is the, the high state university. I also have a PhD in uh, geodesy and glaciology at Ohio State. I went on to Cornell University, where I did a postdoc and started concentrating on the, the fun world of the sensing. Uh, you may have gathered to my accent, I'm from the United States, I'm originally from the East Coast of Scotland. 
and I, I started work over here about 25 years ago. Um, I did a kind of um, student who wasn't phones professors, even though they were the most famous professors in the world. A little further. There, is that? So I'll start talking about that. So I phoned someone while I was at Glasgow University at high school and I said, hey, I'm interested in this at all. And his colleague Gordon uh, said, fine, we'll take you on for a master's, but you have to go to Antarctica. So this was not the decision for somebody of that age. In total, I spent two and a half years working in Antarctica as an expeditions technician. Coming back from Antarctica and starting my postdoc work, I got more and more involved in the field. And Antarctica is beautiful, there's a lot of things But Greenland has, I'm besotted. Uh, Greenland, not just because of the landscape, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the most fantastic landscape I've seen on the planet. Well, because of the people that you are kind and friendly and have been here for thousands of years historically, have a very interesting history and ownership of their own country. So I have an asterisk next to the ice sheet because through time, if you've ever been to an ice sheet, ice sheets are dynamic, they change a lot, but visually it's flat and it's white. It's flat and it's white. For as far as you can see, standing at the South Pole and turning around 360 degrees, you'll see the buildings. But other than that, it's flat and white for as many kilometers as you can see to the distance. Hello. <laughs> right, I'm going to lean. You're going to have to get the casual professor. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to talk more about what happens at the edges of the ice sheet, principally because that's where my funding from NASA and the NSF is coming from just now, is to look at the edges, and because it very importantly has the social aspect to the work as well. Maps of the interior of Greenland are going to be a few contours here and there and nothing else to see. Whereas if you go to the edges of Greenland, you'll see some of the sharpest, most vicious, pointiest mountains that you're ever going to encounter because the frost cracking and heaving processes and processes of erosion and weathering are very, very, very active in the Arctic. So I'm gonna go through um, a little bit of the history of the mapping of Greenland. We're going to look at the stuff that was done on a misnomer here on the ground. It was really done from boats. Then we'll look into some of the airborne mapping stuff, so the start of last century, uh, where, where planes were available, and then bring us right up slap bang to present into what I was doing this morning, uh, for example. I'm actively working on mapping Greenland, and I'll show the reasons for it. So Greenland runs... Uh, Greenland runs from about 59 and a half, 59 and three quarters north to about 83.6 north. It's the most northerly landmass on the planet. It's a place called Cap Morris Jessup. And then there's a couple of islands that seem to appear and disappear offshore of Cap Morris Jessup, a little to the north of that. Put it into context, it's about five times the size of California. So it's pretty big. It's not as big as you see it on the Mercator projection maps. There's a, a great West Wing episode about how big Greenland is compared to how big Africa is, if you want to look that up. In Greenlandic, uh, it's Karalit Nunat. Uh, the Greenlandic language is extremely interesting. It has uh, less letters in their alphabet. A Q is not necessarily followed by a U, and the words are all composite. So. Um, the wet snow falling on the ground is a word that's probably 47 letters or so long. Um, it's really interesting. Within Greenland itself, there's the West Greenlandic dialect, um, which is the Kalalit, um, and that's generally the most populated and the most, uh, biggest proportion of Greenlandic speakers are on the west coast of Greenland. 
At the tournament of the Tuning region, which is East Greenland, there's only about 5,000 of them compared to the rest of the population. And so they speak East Greenlandic. And East Greenlandic and West Greenlandic are generally, they can understand each other, but it's like a very heavy slang uh, between the two. In the north, farthest north parts of Greenland, um, which are kind of separated, we'll see physically why in a minute, uh, you have the polar Inuit who are the Inuktum, and they're mostly in the town of Kanak, the Sirpalak, uh, further to the north. The majority of people living in Greenland are Greenlandic Inuit. Uh, there's a large influx of Danes as well. The island or the continent, or however you want to uh, describe it, is a protectorate of Denmark. It's pushing pretty heavily for independence, but it's one of it's a self-governing nation, apart from foreign policies and defence. Um, within the Kingdom of Denmark. So there are geopolitics involved as with everything involving matters. It's about 56,000 people within Greenland. It's the least densely populated country on the planet. And about 19,000 of them live in Nuuk, the capital, where I'm off to in about five weeks' time to go and do some work. Uh, that is the, the emblem of Greenland, their heraldic shield, which is it's not quite reproduced properly. It's a, a dark blue uh, polar bear uh, sticking to the that we are criticizing. So next slide, please. So uh, again, Greenland stretches from about 59 north to uh, 83 south. Uh, 83 north. Um, it's made up of four municipalities, um, which I'm not really going to try and pronounce. Most people live stretching from here and round up to here. So uh, with this area being largely uninhabited in Melbourne Bay and the west and south of here, it's largely uninhabited because there's just not any bedrock showing. And it's the, the prime breeding area in Greenland and the two prime breeding areas in Greenland for polar bears, which are actually a threat. Weapon, uh, when you're in Greenland, and uh, a 44 Magnum will not stop a boat. So you have to carry something bigger, and that's a hassle. So stay away from the polar bears rather than live around them. Um, the Greenlandic flag uh, shows uh, the ice cap and uh, the rising sun. So the capital of Greenland is Nook, and Nook is down uh, here. And then the highest point in Greenland uh, is uh, the mountain called Gunbjorn. They thought for the longest time it was called, uh, there was another mountain called Mount Forel, just to the southwest of it. But Gunbjorn uh, is sitting in the Stoning Alps up here, and it uh, has a height of about 3,700 meters. So the continent is pretty craggy around the edges. Uh, the highest uh, non-mountain is Summit, which sits pretty much in the geographic center of Greenland, and that's where there is currently a scientific base run primarily by the National Science Foundation uh, from the US. So to go into the history, um, early maps um, were produced, and the, the Cantina Planisphere is a fairly famous map that the, the Portuguese explorers uh, put together in about 1495 to 1498, and then the Italians promptly nicked it. Um, as I said, maps are geopolitical tools. They have uh, strategic value, and this was whisked off to Venice uh, by an Italian spy from under the noses of the Portuguese. Greenland itself was discovered by Westerners, let's say the Vikings, in about the 10th century. And the Treaty of Norway uh, gave them dominance over the region. The Eric the Red, uh, son of Leif Erikson, uh, set up colonies, we think, in west, southwest Greenland. Uh, some of them are underwater now due to weird sea level changes. Um, some people think there might be some undiscovered colonies, uh, archaeological finds in southeast Greenland, but that area is so hard to get to uh, due to sea ice and just the rough weather. Southeast Greenland to have an eight-meter snowfall in one year is not unusual. The, the 
mass accumulation of snow there is incredible. So again, uh, 10th century, this was found, and then it was largely forgotten for about 300 years. Uh, nobody really did anything about it. And then uh, the Danes wandered in, in, in around the 1700s. And that was mostly because of uh, Lutheran uh, and Monrovian missionaries who set up shop. So Hans Ecke was a Monrovian missionary uh, he was born in northern Norway, above the Arctic Circle, um, but he, did, he moved to Denmark and he decided to do um, conversions for folks uh, out in Greenland. He set up the capital of Nook. There wasn't a settlement there before. Uh, the Inuit were largely migratory. They stayed where they needed uh, for hunting and fishing. Um, so he set up a church in Nook church became very popular. Uh, Lutheran Christianity is the official religion of Greenland. And uh, unfortunately, he also brought smallpox with him and killed about half the population of Greenland at the time, which was only about 9,000 people uh, over the area. So about 4,000 of them, including his wife, uh, passed away due to smallpox. He made a pretty good map for something based from ship observations. The, the, the kind of um, the physiography and the shapes of the fjords were, were not too bad. He did swap the west coast to the east coast, um, which is a bit of a mess. But still, for 1723, he made a decent map of southern Greenland. And you can see on modern satellite images uh, the corresponding areas that he was interested in. So, um, uh, about 25 years later, uh, the royal photographer for the British uh, monarchy, uh, Emmanuel Bowen, uh, made another map of Greenland. Uh, he was Welsh, and he basically took Edgar's uh, verbal descriptions of his map and what other people had seen around Greenland and waved his arms a little bit around the side of the mountains here and fjord there and came up with this thing. And this, this is a beauty. Uh, he postulated there was a fjord that went right across to the opposite side of Greenland. There's no such thing, but some of the longest fjord systems on the planet uh, do occur in Greenland. I'm going to skip forward from the 18th century and pass up the 19th century, uh, just in the interests of time. So um, going from uh, the 19th century was obviously the the age of the start of heroic exploration. We had the stuff going on in Antarctica. We also had similar expeditions uh, up into the Canadian Arctic, largely looking for uh, the Northwest Passage. So fast trade over to the, the West Coast of the US. And then of course the Franklin Expedition where everyone got lost and that spurred even more expeditions for people looking for the Franklin Expedition. Um, but those technologies, it's like this. Um, so those technologies. Hi. <laughs> uh, those technologies included steamships and coal-fired uh, schooners. Um, a lot of them built uh, near my hometown in Scotland. Uh, the Erebus and uh, various other ships were built in Dundee in the east coast of Scotland. And in fact, the discovery Captain Scott's ship uh, from going down to uh, the Antarctic is in port in Dundee, and you can go and traipse around it and have a look at the officer's mess and everything else. It's a historical exhibit. So looking from the ground and looking from hearsay and looking from just talking culturally to the people around, they produced some pretty decent maps in the 18th century. But we're going to jump to the start of the 20th century. And that's the start of um, the airborne Era. So uh, in the 1930s, especially, especially the Danes, with some help from their Norwegians, things weren't quite so contentious with them then, uh, flew around in Henkel uh, hydroplanes or, or flying, flying boats, seaplanes. Uh, these were uh, three seater, three cockpits. Um, so you had the, the pilot in the front, you had a radio man in the middle. 
And at the back during the war, you would have had a machine gunner. Uh, instead, they cut a hole in the floor. And so the pilot uh, flew along a route and then the photographer took photos between his legs and down through the floor of the, the aircraft. The big problem with this aircraft is it has an operating altitude of around 4,000 meters, 12,000 feet. And the mountains around the edge of Greenland are often close to that. Also, you'll note that it's an open air cockpit. Not the warmest environment uh, to be flying around in Greenland. So um, in about uh, the 1930s, mid-33 or so, the Danish government uh, started three different mapping projects uh, to kind of claim some sovereignty of Greenland. Uh, and again, it was really the, the Greenlandic mapping agency, the Marines, the, the, the Danish Marines, and uh, the uh, Danish Army flying corps uh, that did a lot of this mapping. Uh, they had, for the time, really advanced techniques, really advanced cameras. Um, but uh, they only had three planes, and it took them several years to get through the mapping of what they actually wanted for Greenland. So, um, go to the next slide, please. Yeah, the idea was um, to take uh, vertical images, but that was actually impossible. Um, so they took uh, oblique images, uh, and actually the um, oblique images turned out to be useful, as we'll see in just a few minutes. Um, they originally took about 45,000 kilometers, flight kilometers, uh, to do the mapping around the edges of Greenland. Uh, those um, uh, mapping exercises were, were largely ongoing but they stopped uh, due to the influence of the Second World War in 1939. In this, you've got uh, a fairly famous uh, Danish explorer of Greenland, uh, Lodge Koch, uh, who's in the middle, and uh, his uh, pilots and co-pilots are on the left and the right of them. And the fluffy bunny suits, uh, that's polar bear skins and polar bear fur that they're using to keep them warm at altitude. As someone who's hung out the side of a helicopter at 2,000 feet above Antarctica with the door open taking pictures, you need something like that. It's probably better than the sort of stuff that we get from Gore-Tex and REI. So um, the, the seventh Thule uh, ex expedition um, surveyed the southeast coast of Greenland in 1932 and 1933. And uh, what we have here is uh, Helheim Glacier. Now, if you ever read any of the literature about Greenland falling apart, you're going to encounter Helheim Glacier. It's one of the fastest, most dynamic glaciers in the world. When you look at something like this, it, it's just an absolute treasure trove. You've got a snapshot of what this environment was like back in 1933-1934. We can come back to the space era. Again, Yuri Gargarin, I was going to steal my thunder on that one. Um, we can come back to the satellite-based era, like the 72-ish when Landsat went up. And we can start comparing things like where the glacier front is, the, the terminus of the glacier, in 1933 compared to 1972 compared to the yes. So we can start doing some serious science if we can get our hands on this photographic evidence. Um, generally, these photos, the, the Danish realized how important they were. They were classified and they were hidden away uh, for a long time. When I say they were hidden away, they were lost. They lost all the photographs from the 1930s. Uh, surveys done in Greenland until about six years ago, where a colleague of mine, uh, Andres Bork, from the National Museum in Copenhagen, for some reason got a phone call saying, hey, we're in this castle way the heck out in the middle of the countryside in, in Denmark, and there's all these photos lying around in the basement. And so they digitized every single one of them. I think it was something like 132,000 of them. 
Um, and they're now available for us to do some science on. So uh, serendipity strikes again and lets us take a big leap forward in our understanding of the Green Revolution. Greenland's strategic, and during the Second World War, Denmark, as you know, was occupied by the Nazis. Uh, and Greenland had a very difficult point. Do they throw themselves into independence at that point? Do they cede control of their territory to somebody else? And eventually they made an agreement with the US that the US would protect them without taking over uh, their territory. Next slide, please. The, the Nazis uh, set up uh, several weather stations on the northeast coast of Greenland, which is the area where sea ice comes down from the polar front to the north of that and basically makes that inaccessible to boats unless you're very, very lucky. And those weather stations provided information for uh, U-boat operations and generally weather, knowing the weather in this sector of Antarctica, sorry, this sector of the Arctic was super important, especially because the weather systems would affect convoys trying to resupply northern Russia. So strategically, these were really important. Um, a lot of them weren't discovered for months or years. And the Danish set up what's called the Sirius Patrol, which still runs today, where it's effectively Danish special forces, two or three of them, plus a bunch of dogs, plus a bunch of sledges, and they still use the dogs. And they traverse up this northeast coast of Greenland, just keeping an eye on it. It is the world's largest national park up there. It's hard to get into. And you really, if you're into trouble, you want a serious patrol person to come and find you. Um, there were a couple of fatalities. Generally, the Germans shot people or the Danish shot the Germans uh, without fully understanding what was going on. But it's cold, it's dark. Remember, this is polar night for several months of the year. Uh, lots of confusion in those areas, but the, the bases and the weather stations, none of them managed to exist by the end of the year. They were all closed down with either Danish or American intervention um, in them. So that led, next slide please. Oh, oh, that doesn't show too much. Uh, that, that led to a US presence, which is still ongoing in Greenland. Um, firstly, uh, in the 60s and uh, all the way through the 80s, there were Loran stations, which are long range uh, radio stations that help you navigate. And as you know, as mappers, navigation for where I, where I am, how well I know where I am, is really important for making the maps work. Then with the Soviet threat starting up in the, the 60s and 70s, the uh, US also installed Juline stations, distant early warning radar stations, some of which are still there on the ice cap. Uh, big, bulbous, uh, round radar domes that are just sitting decrepit and gradually being buried uh, by the environment. They also set up uh, ballistic early warning radar up at Patufik or in Thule, uh, which is up, up here in the very far northwest of Greenland. That facility is now operated by the US Space Force, uh, is active and has uh, up-to-date radars uh, peering over the horizon towards Russia to detect any ballistic missile threat. There were also, um, during the Second World War, Greenland was how you got equipment to Europe. It was hard to fly straight over the Atlantic. You were doing it by air. So you would fly up to Goose Bay or Gander in Halifax in Nova Scotia. Then you'd pop up to Kangalushuak, which is Blue West 8, was its, its code word, on the west coast of Greenland. And that's where we'll be landing on our way to Greenland in a couple of weeks' time or a few weeks' time. And then there was a set, uh, series of other airports around Greenland, all with the Bluey moniker. It's Bluey West, Blue West something or Bluey East something. And two of those have turned into international airports, although there's not very many international flights to them. Uh, there's one down here in Narsarswak, that was Blue East 1. And then there's one up here in Kulasuk, uh, which is Blue East 2. 
pages two is co-located with the July New York extension. So all of these things led to better navigation, but the big revolution was when GPS uh, came in and you didn't really have to have a ground segment in order to navigate your plane uh, better. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just before the GPS era, which was 1994, 1996, um, the, the Danes completed yet another photogrammetric survey of Greenland. They did it over four years. They surveyed the north of the island in 1978, most of the rest of the island in 1981 and 1985, and then they filled in some of the blanks uh, in 1987. And they used uh, GPS ground stations, uh, which they thought they precisely positioned so they could get an idea of where their planes were. They used uh, the, the Doris Doppler system to navigate their planes. Um, they set up triangulation points like the disks that we have kicking around everywhere. Um, and you can still stumble across them when you're in the wilds of Greenland. Um, and then they just used some, some places that they said, well, that place looks the same height as that place over there, and that place has no height on it. We're going to call that sea level. And then they tried to produce an ortho mosaic and uh, digital elevation models for all of Greenland. And they actually did really quite a nice job. Uh, next slide. Please. So on the left there, it's kind of hard to see with this projector, but we have an ortho photograph um, where we've got a, a glacier coming in from the right hand side and curling round into a fjord. This is just north of Nook, another glacier carving off into the ocean there. We have uh, a hill shaded DEM where we simulate the sun shining on the topography. And then we have a reliability mask, the question of how good did we do uh, when we're doing these calculations. I think we're going to turn the lights down a bit. Maybe. Yeah, that helps with the contrast. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, looking at their mean errors um, calculated from modern techniques, you can see that most of the error was down close to zero in the horizontal. The heights get uh, a little worse as we get towards the edges of the ice caps, largely because we're away from where our uh, sole sources or our core sources of our navigation points are coming from. So we're having to extrapolate out where the location of the plane is further and further and further. And as you do that, the uncertainties and errors on your mapping grow. So in general, um, these ortho photos from the, the late 70s and uh, mid 80s are accurate to about plus or minus six meters, which you know, going back that amount of time is actually pretty decent uh, for a place like Greenland, as I say, rough, 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 rough topography. They give us the, the ability to do things like this. Next slide, please. So this is looking at uh, Kangarlushuak Glacier. Confusingly, in Greenland, there's the Kangarlushuak Airport, which is on the west side of the country, and the Kangarlushuak Glacier on the east side of the country. And the only difference is, well, they spelled it wrong. There should be a D in the glacier. And then it's Kangarlushuak Glacier on the east coast. So the glacier is flowing in from the top left into a fjord and out into the sea. And you can see that between uh, 1981 and 2008, at least 30 meters of ice was lost in that glacier. That's probably a vast underestimate. Uh, it's probably just that the color is saturated out. Um, we actually see that if we go from the front into the glacier, over that time, you know, 200 meters of ice has easily been lost um, in things. Sounds like a lot. The fastest glacier I look at is in Patagonia, and it's been shrinking at about 45 meters per year uh, vertically. Um, if you take that to a decade, 450 meters, that's the height of the Empire State Building, gone in 10 years' time of ice in Patagonia. That's the fastest one 
I know about it. Anyway. It's like the uh, probably well over a kilometer. So if you focus from the ice sheet, which is a kilometer to two kilometers thick, into a narrow valley. And so it gets, it's well over deep. It might sit 100 meters or so above sea level when you get to the front, but it'll be 900, 800 meters of ice underneath the water uh, and grounded on the bedrock at the front there. Um, Kangaloo swags, a monster. It moves very, very quickly. Um, this thing's probably moving 20 inches a day. So it's, it's shifting very quickly. It's one of the main uh, means of getting ice from the interior of Greenland out into the ocean. The biggest one in Greenland is on the other side of the country. It's called Jakobshavn East Bay. Uh, it's slowing down now, but at one point it was doing 45 meters per day. Uh, Jakobshavn is fairly famous because NASA keeps on paying people to go and look at it because it's really fast. But it's also very high likelihood that the iceberg that sank the Titanic came from Jakobshavn. So uh, it's about halfway up on the western coast of Greenland. It's now a UN World Park, um, but it's it's pretty easy to get to. So it's, it's well swamped with scientific instrumentation. Further to the north of Kangaroo Swag Glacier, we've got the Dugard Jensen uh, Glacier. And you can see that that's profile three over here. And between 1987 and 2014, no, the glacier's not doing that much. Uh, it's maybe thinned a few tens of meters at the most. So glaciers which are, are relatively close to each other in Greenland can be completely different. So that's kind of the benefits of the old air photography, you know, with the ship point photography. Now we're getting into my bread and butter, which is the satellite. So the next slide, please. And so, in about 1999, this little algorithm uh, was developed. I think the guy was, in, was either the University of Toronto or the University of British Columbia. I forget off the top of my head. This single invariant feature transport, SIFT, is an algorithm that you really you could use the algorithm when it was invented in 1989, but it's really only been. 10 years since about 2010, where compute power has got to the stage that we can really exploit this algorithm to automatically map things for us. This is when you have your cell phone. You hold up your cell phone and you want to do a panorama, you can choose that within your photo options, and you can push your cell phone across and it takes a view of multiple pictures and then it stitches them all together. That's based on the SIFT algorithm. Without that, your cell phone wouldn't do it. So it allows you to stitch photos together very rapidly. It also allows us to um, take into advan advantage, if I take a photo of something, and then I move and take a photo of something, and then I move again and take a photo of something, I can use my motion with what I'm looking at to use an algorithm called structure from motion. So as long as the camera moves, you can make a map of what you're looking at. You can, move, make, you can infer the depth map of what you're looking at. So it takes away the, the eye-bending headache causing looking through a stereoscope to train a line, uh, to draw a line um, on your on your maps your contours and it does it automatically for you this allows us to say, design and build structure from motion applications it allows us to use drones on a very local scale as long as they've got a decent camera to make maps from it and the uncertainty there is often where is the drone and what's it looking at and that's why you spend a lot of money on expensive drones that know where they're looking and know what they're looking at. It allows us to get photos from tourists who just happen to take a photo of something. And then somebody at another time who happened to take a photo of the same thing from a different angle, we can take those and make them into a three-dimensional model. We can also improve those models when we combine them with satellite imagery. 
somebody, well, an old colleague of mine at Cornell, uh, Lewis Nathan, uh, and John Michael Fromm at uh, UNC have a paper called Mapping the Earth in Six Days. And back in, oh, I think it was about 2012, they managed to get into, uh, or they, managed, they were given access to 1.2 billion photos sitting on the internet that Microsoft just collects because people upload them. I think it's flickers. And they made three dimensional models of tens, if not hundreds, of cities on the planet just from tourist photos taking shots. So all of these tourist photos that are taken, you get two or three of them, you can start doing body adjustments on them. And you can start saying, I know what the three dimensions are that I'm looking at. And then this is this is kind of my bread and butter. So just to show an example of that, um, I went down to Bolivia, and on the left there we have a drone um, ortho museum of the Isla de Colasi, uh, which is in the middle of the big salt lake in Bolivia. We use it to calibrate the satellite measurements. And it's got a resolution of about four centimeters. Our big problem is we're in central and light is an expensive thing at the time, so we had to put ground control into all of this. And uh, that's just a, a vertical view from the drone. The drone was flying pretty low, it was only flying at about 400 feet. Um, we managed to get a north of the entire island, uh, and you can see it's got uh, 96 million faces and 14 That took eight five hours of processing on this computer. <laughs> Next slide. And to give you an idea, again, it's hard to see, but you see all these little black bits showing up. These are individual cacti on the island. So if you wanted to repeat this, you could get an idea of how fast the cacti grow. Uh, you can see which cacti are being knocked down by the wind. You can see that this guy in their Toyota Hilux has a roof rack on uh, from this sort of stuff. So incredible precision, and it boggles the mind with what you can actually uh, do with this. So there's been a revolution in UAV-driven mapping, but there's also been a revolution with the satellite image. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is a, a lovely view of Mount Fuji in Japan, um, out the uh, window of an airliner flying up the coast of Japan. Except this is from Worldview 2, a satellite that's 710 kilometers in orbit. And so this is the sort of thing that Maxar down the road here in Westminster can produce. Um, exquisite detail where we can see the structure of the clouds, we can see kowars and uh, snowfall in the mountains in the background. Uh, this satellite is one of the constellation which they can be slew off Nadir and take pictures at really high oblique angles. And if they take a picture, travel a little bit down their orbit, swing back and look back at the same place and take a second picture, you have your classic stereo airborne photography that you can then produce a digital surface model. These satellites are typically taking shots of between 35 centimeters and 50 centimeter resolution. And we can go to the next slide. And uh, there's four of them. There was five, but their newest one broke in a hurry. So Worldview 4 was launched a couple of years ago, but is no longer uh, no longer able to point in the with the precision that we need to do this stuff. So GOI was launched by Google. But Maxar, or Digital Globe at the time, bought it. And then Paul Aerospace down the road here again in Boulder built the buses and most of the instrumentation for Worldview 1, which is panchromatic. It only takes grayscale. Uh, Worldview 2, which is multispectral. And Worldview 3, which are all currently orbiting. And they're uh, tasked satellites. So they only take a shot when somebody wants them to. The US Department of Defense said, we're going to give Maxar a couple of billion dollars and we want them to take photos of what we want. 
And as an aside to that, some scientists, myself included, were able to say, okay, we want some things tasked in areas that are not of strategic importance to the US. I can't go and task this over Afghanistan. But if I want some shots in Chile or Greenland, strategic values near zero, they'll go and do it for us. Next slide, please. So the main difference is, again, this is a World View 2 image of an ice shelf. Uh, this one's actually in Antarctica. Is that compared to older model Landsats and older model satellites, they have a greater bit depth. So most older satellites see at about 8 bits. These see at 10 bits. Let's check at 11 bits. So there's information where things are in shadows. And there's information when the returns, the reflectance is very high. So over snow, where we can actually see that patch of snow in this image is the same patch of snow in that image. And that's what's required to make a digital elevation. You need to be able to identify the same point in two scenes. Um, they also point very, very accurately. I don't know quite how they're doing it. I presume they've got lots of star trackers on them. But if uh, once you've processed up digital global imagery and it says you are here, you're typically within nine feet of where it tells you that you are on the planet. So that makes um, figuring out your photogrammetry or the, the different kinds of photogrammetry you use easier than it would have been in the past because your search areas are small. Next slide, please. So that doesn't show up at all because it's black on black. Um, on the left, imagine Antarctica. You've got East Antarctica here and the Antarctic Peninsula there, going around to the Ross Sea, but in lots of places. Uh, and Greenland sitting about here. This is what they shot yesterday. So they can collect about a California of coverage in a day. Um, again, we're doing targets of opportunity in the polar regions. Um, again, it's hard to tell the color differences between what is cloudy and what's not cloudy. So let's look at a week in scale. So this is what they shot this last week uh, for the polar regions. You're starting to get more of an idea of how Antarctica looks, how it really looks. The reason it doesn't go so far south in Antarctica is it's still dark. So, um, or it's getting darker in Antarctica through time. Uh, eventually, they won't shoot anything. These are optical satellites. They require the reflection from the sun. That looks pretty good. So that's the last seven days. The next slide, please. That's everything we've shot. So everything since about 2010. And you can see Antarctica, apart from a little pole at South Pole, has been shot with this sort of step. This is just the stereo. They shoot a lot more individual shots as well, but they blanketed all of Antarctica as best as they can, and lots of the Northern Hemisphere. They don't bother over sea ice at the of time. The hardest place that we found on the planet for shooting this stuff is Western Russia. It's just cloudy all the time. So these, this is everything you've ever collected. There's still gaps over Western Russia. There's a weird smell. Weeds and why there's so many military facilities in Western Russia. You can't see them from all the satellites. And to give you an idea of how this changes things, next slide, please. Um, so, this is the only digital elevation model at the time that was available for the entire country of Iceland. It's not the best one, uh, but the best one that the Icelanders had access to doesn't blanket the whole country. So this is their national DEF. That's what we can do. So we can see individual houses. Uh, we can see individual gardens. If your grandmother was standing still long enough, we can tell you how tall your grandmother is. Um, this is precise to between 20 and 30 centimeters in the vertical. And we've done it everywhere. So the Arctic DEM uh, was uh, initiated by the Obama uh, Office of White House, uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. The US was the chair of the Arctic Council at the time, and it's traditional that we leave the 
article D so we want to see product for everyone else to use. Article D again is the US legacy product for everyone else to use. Um, the software was developed by a team at Ohio State University. I was involved uh, with mostly the calibration side of it. The software is free, it's open source, anyone can use it, and it is now the National Geospatial Agency's primary software for creating digital image models. I do want to tell you. So uh, it's powerful and doing everywhere with it, as is the NGO. They're, they're working on Earth Day just now, which will be a two meter resolution repeat elevation model of the Earth from everything that Maxar has ever collected in the sky. And that's where the big revolution has happened. We're not just taking one shot and making a map in. We're taking shot after shot after shot after shot. Now, problematically, this is tasks. So we're not getting something like Landsat or Sentinel, where it's going to be a shot every six days. We get a, we get a shot when we can. But we can start see, thing, see things like this, start seeing things like this. This is a lake. It's 500 meters below the surface of the green bush that emptied. And then it started filling up. We didn't know how it was filling up because there was no real source of water at the bottom of the ocean at that point. Then we saw in the optical imagery of the world we have, it's accurate enough that we can see little streams flowing into the cranks next to where this lake had emptied. And it's starting to fill the lake 500 meters below the surface of the ocean with surface water. And we can see through time this kind of basin that formed when the lake emptied, filling back up through time. It's since done this three times, where you've got, and we just couldn't have seen this with a single snapshot of a mapping tree over here. The benefit is we can now not just map things, we can map the changes of things as well. Almost, almost kind of sort of done. Next slide, please. Remember we talked about structure from motion. Well, we can, we can create some machine learning routines that sit there and go, okay, this is an air photo from 1955. They didn't know where they were because they didn't have GPS or anything else like that, but we can guess where they were. And then a computer can sit there and go, okay, that point in 1955 corresponds to this point on a worldview satellite image in 2014. And we can train it with the SIFT algorithm and this another one called RANSET. And we can say, okay, well, this point corresponds to this point, this point corresponds to that point. We can start mapping changes automatically since 1955. With that, next slide, please we can apply structure from motion. This is an island in the Northern Ross Sea of Antarctica from 1961 that we've been able to create in three dimensions because we have the modern imagery that gives us automated ground control points around the island. And then we can start differencing and see where the penguins are, where the seals are, where the ice has changed. So that's kind of the history of some of the techniques and some of the things that we've seen in Greenland. And now um, my wife and I uh, wrote uh, a big proposal to the National Science Foundation. And that's the reason we're going up to Greenland in five weeks time. So next slide. Uh, we've managed to get an award called the Navigating the New Arctic. And this is a strategic award from the National Science Foundation that is at the director level. It's not within uh, geology or biology, it's a director level project where they, they say, you know, we want people to look at how changes are occurring in the Arctic because it's of importance to the rest of the planet. And so it's one of NSF's big 10 ideas. And basically we said, we're gonna look at hazards. So I'm, I'm blending in my, my love of geology and geography and geodesy and remote sensing with hazards as well, uh, which I teach a lot. The Arctic is warming, the environment is changing. There's no, no doubt about it. The ice sheets, ice caps and glaciers are receding and changing through time. Uh, and they can, uh, can trigger 
hazards to the local population. So one of the big ones is landslides that come off the side of a fjord wall into a fjord, deep water body, can create tsunami-like waves. And in 2017, did uh, and destroyed an entire village and killed four people. So we're going to try and come in uh, and map how Greenland is changing with the aim of predicting where things may be getting worse, put in warning systems and put in real-time monitoring systems that can give locals uh, the chance to get out of harm's way as necessary. We've made it really important that we partner with the Greenlanders. This project is not us coming in and being saviors. This is a project to build the skills in Greenland too so that they can do this themselves. They helped write, Greenlanders helped write the proposal. So it's a project on Greenland, but for Greenland as well, a uh, big partnership. So we've got US and Greenlandic scientists and Greenlandic residents, because even Greenlandic scientists may not be the experts. Somebody who's lived in the same place for 40 years is probably gonna know more about that place than a Greenlandic scientist who lives in Nook. Um, we want to do research that addresses community needs. Um, and so we're going to look at unstable land, we'll look at permafrost, we'll look at landslides, we'll look at sea ice, uh, everything across uh, Greenland. Next slide, please. Almost done. We're looking at the intersection between natural environment, the built environment, and the social systems that operate in Greenland, which is why we have a social scientist involved, my wife, uh, oh, that section. You had to impact at least several things around the outside of this diagram. And so our work has global impact. It helps the Arctic residents. It helps them with resilient infrastructure for the risks that they're going to be uh, occurring. Um, our data and observation and big data. Uh, this will probably generate close to 400 terabytes worth of data. Um, and we'll have an education. Next slide. So um, the rationale for this was looking at yet another kind of satellite. This is laser altimetry. Um, laser altimetry is under the ISAT program, ISAT-1 and ISAT-2. ISAT-1 ran between 2003 and 2010, and ISAT-2 was launched in 2018. Uh, if you difference these laser altimetry tracks over Greenland, you can see that most of Greenland uh, has lost ice around the edges. It's somewhere between 3 and 10 meters per year. And as you remove that ice, you're exposing more rock to weathering and erosion, more landslides. Uh, you're changing the climate of Greenland, you're changing the water supplies, you're changing the permafrost, you're changing the building materials available. To you. Next slide. Please. And so um, this is a, a little bit more esoteric. We're also changing how the crust of Greenland is flexing and changing with different loads on it. If you take off 10 meters of ice, over a few tens of square kilometers, year after year after year, the ice bounces back in response, which changes again the kind of stresses and strains available on the mountainside, whether it's going to be wet. Um, I was involved with installing most of these. These are continuous GPS stations around Greenland. We now have 55 of them. We started installing them in 2007, and a couple of years ago, the National Science Foundation sold them to the Greenland government for a dollar. Um, so we've still got that connection with the Greenlanders. Now we have fiducial points, we have control points all over Greenland that can be used to improve our mapping. Next slide. But we've talked about optical, we just talked about lasers. We've also got radar satellites that are looking at Greenland. And we're finding that not every place in Greenland is moving the same way. Again, we want to see how this exposes risks and provides risks to the Greenlanders. And so uh, we're mapping the changes to the bedrock and the ice around Greenland every six days, and that's all going to be publicly available. So we are using supercomputers until they're melted. Next slide. Uh, and one of the things uh, we're concentrating on, and the thing that I'm working on most closely just now, is where are the landslides? Uh, again, not many people live in Southeast Greenland, so there's not much knowledge of the landslides there. And if there were a landslide, it wouldn't necessarily affect a community. But on the west coast, where a lot of people live, 
landslides and cause tsunamis. Which are cool. Next slide. And Carrot Fjord uh, is the classic example. This is the this uh, small town, eighty people, Nagutsiak, and uh, in that bottom image, it's hard to see, but there are icebergs sitting by people's floors, ten meters above sea level. Um, there are videos of this online. Uh, some of them are fairly harrowing, um, but it was a, a when the splash first occurred, the wave was nineteen meters tall. So by the time it reached this village about 20 meters later, it was only about four or five meters tall, actually it was less than about two meters tall, but it splashed 10 meters above sea level. Uh, it washed away. There's, there's actually a house floating away the floor here. Uh, there also. So our aim is to at least provide some warning um, prototype systems to provide some work. Next slide. And so um, I said about tourist photos. The day after the landslide, the Greenland military flew up the fjord and um, they took tourist photos outside of the helicopter, which were kindly passed on to me and managed to make three dimensional models um, from the tourist photos. Just a guy snapping a shot out of the window, out of the window, out of the window, out of the window. And then I can difference that with satellite derived digital elevation models from before the event. And we saw this big red and blue um, shows that about, about 250 meters deep of rock face went down into the fjord. It's about 56 million cubic meters of rock fell off the side of the mountain um, into the fjord, created a 50 meter, it's closer to a 90 meter, this is an old slide, 50 meter splash wave. And we're still trying to figure out how the why this uh, uh, again kind of hard to see in this but the landslide basically took this whole area and shoved it that direction there's another landslide a nascent landslide that's moving about 20 centimeters a year up here but it's more it's about a sixth the size of the original so we're not actually too worried about that one next slide please. however this is where the landslide occurred, and the Swiss are convinced that this whole area, which would be five times the size of the big landslide, is ready to go. Our imagery right now doesn't show that, but we want to be really, really sure that one of us is right. So we, that's one of the areas uh, we're going to be investigating. The landslide was at this region. The town that was hit was over there, it took about 20 minutes. For the wave to get to it. So we hope that we can uh, look close in and detect that wave and provide some work. Next slide. Um, so the radar, because it can see at night, it's an active system, uh, it can see through clouds. It doesn't really care about water vapor being between you and the target. The radar lets us measure how things move. So um, this is a, a Sentinel-1 uh, imagery. Uh, there's probably a thousand uh, scenes being correlated in there. And we can get an idea of how the ice sheet moves on a 6 to 12 day basis for little patches of the ice sheet. And then we can put that together into a grand map for a yearly basis on how the ice sheet moves. So again, we can look at change. So we can look at lasers, we can look at optical, active sensors such as radar and intruder mapping to understand. Next slide. I'm going to skip this one because I gather I'm probably way over time. Am I way over time? Or? Pretty over time. Okay, I'll, I'll switch to the next one then. Um, so with optical imagery, laser altimetry, radar sensors, and airborne and satellite sensors, of those as well, we can fuse them all together. It allows us to look at high resolution that we've not been able to do before, and it allows us to look at change. And with that, we can work at a variety of scales from things down to a few centimeters, just things that are kilometers across. I'm interested in processes and all scales. And the whole point of our most recent work that I just talked about, the NNA, is to work with the Greenlanders to do science for the benefit of the Greenlanders. 
Sorry for running over so long, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Have we got time for questions or do people really need a coffee? <laughs> So that, that kind of is my field. <laughs> um, so Greenland is currently melting at about 200 times its historical rate. Um, if you go back uh, to the last century and get proxy data, you can get an idea of what it's changing. So, um, oh man, you've, tr you've triggered me. <laughs> they do, actually the 1930s were probably a big melt time like present. So there's, there's hints that in the 30s, something weird was going on. As I was explaining to my class today, a, a glacier in Greenland retreating is no big news. It's not a big deal. All the glaciers in Greenland retreating at once, we have an issue. And that's, that's kind of where we are. Is, uh, the vast majority of the glaciers in Greenland are thinning and losing mass at rates that are elevated compared to what we see in the past. Um, so putting it into context, there's something going on, whether it's ocean driven, whether it's dynamics driven, whether it's air temperature driven, we need to sort that out. But that's why the science agencies are throwing money uh, towards these projects. Um, there's a nasty little trick with ice loss at the poles called rotational feedback or fingerprinting. In that if Greenland loses mass, which it is rapidly, most of the sea level rise caused by Greenland is going to manifest itself on the northeast coast of South America, which is a low-lying coast in some places. What we need to worry about is if West Antarctica loses mass, most of the sea level change from that is going to mass manifest itself on the east coast of the USA. And so if your globally average rise of sea level by 2100 is just, for example, say a meter, this rotational feedback mechanism will mean that in New York State, it'll go up between 1.5 and 1.8 meters. So it's not equally spread over the planet because of rotation and gravitational feedback. So what happens in Greenland doesn't stay in Greenland. What happens in Antarctica doesn't stay in Antarctica. Beach property in Miami. Not a good investment idea. I didn't say that. That is not the official stance of the University of Colorado or Syracuse. But don't buy beach property in Miami. Yeah, that's only good. It might get a little hot for you. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> I know exactly where it is, to within a few meters. Um, it's a place called Camp Century, uh, which is in northwest Greenland, uh, to the upstream of uh, Duker Smith Glacier. Uh, my colleague Mike McFerrin got a lot of uh, media coverage because he predicted that the melting there is going to accelerate and expose. It's not so much the nuclear reactor, it's the wastewater from the nuclear reactor uh, that was left on site. Um, dirty little secret, they did exactly the same in Antarctica at McMurdo Station, which is the main US station there. They built a nuclear reactor, they decommissioned it, and just let a, a radioactive glacier form from the meltwater, uh, from the cooling water that was cooling the reactor, and it's still there on the side of the mountain. And you can go and stick your toe in it if you really want to do something. Um, the one in Antarctica is so cold that we have to get much, 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 much warmer to actually turn that back into a liquid. It is exposed to the environment, the person will to clean up. The one in Greenland will eventually be exposed and someone's going to have to be responsible for cleaning up or else it's going to release a level of radioactivity. We don't know the level, but it's going to release something radioactive into the environment. And the Greenlanders shouldn't be responsible for that because they didn't build it. Um, those uh, airfields I talked about, the one east and the one west, until about three years ago, there was upwards of 120,000 rusty fuel tanks, uh, fuel drums lying most of, or I know the one in the one east, 120,000 rusty fuel tanks just lying there. Uh, 
thankfully the US stepped forward and they started cleaning. I think they've cleaned that one up completely just in the last year. Uh, so we have left a legacy. Um, the US is popular in Greenland. Uh, it's easier to do science there as an American than maybe a Dane. Um, but we have left a mess. And we should just, because it's the right thing to do, we should do it. They are, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so the sea level is driven by the gravitational potential of the planet, the geoid. And so the geoid is relatively stable. So it's going to, it's going to stabilize at a high level. Uh, it's not then going to slosh backwards and forwards. Um, so uh, sea level is dictated by the force of gravity, which is dictated by the density of the stuff underneath. So what we're actually finding, uh, I have a NASA study studying megacities around the globe and their response or what's happening with sea level at those is that sea level change is a problem. The real problem is subsidence at the cities. So where they're pulling out water for groundwater for consumption, or they're building large buildings that they're moving the mass from over there to over here, it's causing bits of the city to sink. And those rates are faster than sea level rise at this time. So about 20 times faster. We've got Mumbai, part of Mumbai sinking at six centimeters per year. Sea level's going up three millimeters per year at this time. <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, you have to look it into a holistic sense where it's not just the ocean, it's infrastructure and people as well. Well, my wife and I lived in North Carolina for a while where, I don't know if you remember, they banned sea level rise. Um, so a, a group of 50 developers approached the, uh, the Senate there and said, uh, you have to take into consideration sea level rise over the last 100 years at an average rate rather than what sea level is doing now. And it got passed. Um, so King Canute was sitting in uh, the outer banks going, oh, I'm not getting wet. Uh, I'm not get I'm getting wet. Um, so they did revoke it. Um, Development is an issue, not so much mistakes as it is overseas. Um, people like to live on the coast. Uh, it's if you're in a, uh, a country with uh, harder access for, for food security, you want a source of protein, fishing. Um, coasts are strongly biologically productive places and people want to live there they're still exposing themselves to risks that are going to manifest themselves over the next 50 years. Greenland is one of the oldest patches of rock on the planet. Um, it could be uh, mineralogically a superpower. It has rare earths and it has gems, it has uranium, it has all of that. And uh, I'm not picking sides, but the Chinese have been trying to get into Greenland for quite some time. But Greenlanders themselves have a responsibility to their own country. They care about their country and they've actually rebuffed a lot of the Chinese uh, advances. And they've basically not given anyone the opportunity to do that. But when you're trying to charter a helicopter to install a scientific instrument, and a group from Australia, Diamond Prospectors, to hire it from underneath you, that can get annoying. <laughs> Two more questions. Sure, sure. Likely the sea level, because of the gravitational feedback, likely it will drop around Greenland because the ice sheet is so big 
that it actually acts as a gravitational source that pulls the water towards the country. As the ice sheet loses mass, that gravitational attraction will become less and the sea level will probably fall around most of Greenland, at least initially. So there was there was a consolidation uh, proposed in the south. I don't know if that maps up to date or not. Uh, a lot of the villages around Greenland are sadly depopulating. Um, the Greenland government has the ability to close a village down. And if it's not viable, they will sometimes do that. They don't do it regularly, but Nagutsiak, the one hit by the tsunami wave, was basically closed down. The way the Greenland government does that as it says, you're not getting any communications, so they pull out the cell phone towers, and you're not getting any power, and they refuse to bring uh, fuel to the generators that power the towers. So some of them are closing down. Largely, people are moving to Nook or other communities on the west coast of Greenland, especially from the south of Greenland, where you would think it would be easier, but it's so rugged that it's really hard to get around. In the south. Oh, very likely. Um, the US, in response to that, set up a consulate in Nook, which is the first time we've had one there for quite some time. And that's actually hopeful because it's a possible conduit into knowing and working with Greenlanders in a more understanding sense. If you have people who are there, they get into the culture, um, they get into the society. And that's actually, actually a good thing. But yeah, the, the Greenlanders are, are fiercely independent. They're not going to be selling their country to us, and the Danes aren't going to let it happen either at this stage. This was uh, an effective marketing ploy by uh, Eric the Red and Leif Eriksson. Um, when people had uh, migrated from Norway into Iceland, which was largely unpopulated, they called it Iceland, but for some reason, people didn't want to it. So when they got to Greenland on their way to Vinland, um, Nova Scotia and the like, let's call it Greenland. A lot of suckers fell for it. <laughs> so, 